This was the plane which was considered to be the identity of Britain in World War I. Supermarine Speedfire was an excellent fighter plane which was the favourite of pilots due to its speed and agility and was called a war-winning machine for the people. But actually this plane was a victim of a, a very big problem. The problem was that the engine of the plane would stop working when it was dogfighting with the German pilots, especially when it was made to dive downwards. On the other hand, there was no such problem in the German Luftwaffe's Messer Smith 109 fighter plane. This is why the German pilots often dominated the British pilots during the war. Britain won the Battle of Britain with great difficulty, and the biggest reason for this was the problem of the engine of Speedfire. If Britain wanted a clear victory in the rest of World War I, then it was very important to solve this strange problem of Speedfire. They put in a lot of effort and hired big engineering firms. Also tried, but nobody could solve this problem of Spitfire. Finally, a solution was found, and that too from a person from whom no one expected anything. What did this woman do with Spitfire that today she is held responsible for winning the world war by the Allies? Once again in Jam TV videos, The Happy Nazarene. This problem of Spitfire's Rolls-Royce Merlin engine first came up in 1938. At that time, this problem was not considered so big because before the World War, pilots did not do much diving. But in 1940, when the Battle of Britain was at its peak, it was not just a technical problem but had become a question of survival. An even bigger problem was that before World War II, the British government had produced more than 20,000 Spitfires. That is, all these planes had the same problem because all of them were fitted with Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. And then, the seriousness of the matter was realised when the British came to know that the Royal Air Force had other fighter planes besides the Spitfire, which included the Hawker Hurricane and the Bolton Paul Defiant. Now there was the heat of World War II, and on top of that, the Allies had a great history of fighting with planes with defective engines. In 1940, during World War II, Nazi Germany was fighting with France and Britain. During this time, when the Germans came into the Allies' area with their Messerschmitt 109, the Royal Air Force's Spitfires were used to counter them. To avoid each other's bullets, the pilots used advanced maneuvers like immediately diving or immediately lifting the plane up. This was a very common thing in the World War. Planes could fight for hours by doing such maneuvers. Sometimes they would dive down to avoid enemy bullets, and sometimes they would immediately put their nose up and target the other plane and fire. Now, during this life and death dogfight, if someone's engine stops working, what will happen to them? Luckily, in the Battle of Britain, the British pilots had the home court advantage, that is, their fuel supply was close by and they could fight for many hours. On the other hand, the German pilots had to first cross the English Channel, then fight and then go back to their base for refueling. This was a disadvantage for the German pilots. That is why they could not even compete with the defective Spitfires. The Battle of Britain was over, but the World War was still on. This strange problem arose in Spitfires, especially when they would nose dive. When the aircraft starts falling down rapidly in free fall, then anything which is not firmly grounded, like the blood flowing in the body of the pilot and the fuel present in the carburetor of the engine, does not get affected by gravity, and instead of going down, it goes upwards. Unfortunately, the fuel outlets in the carburetor of the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine were downwards. So when the aircraft nose dove fast, the fuel present in the carburetor used to go upwards away from the outlet. During this time, the engine did not get fuel, due to which the engine of the aircraft either stopped or started jerking. The best minds in the world were tasked with solving the problem, including Cyril Luff of Rolls-Royce and Eddie Fisher of the Royal Aircraft Establishment. Both devised some very clever technical solutions, but neither failed. Instead, their solutions created a new problem. 
understanding the problem required a deep knowledge of the engine. So it was surprising that the final and most effective solution came in 1940 from a woman known as Beatrice Schilling. During the first production test flights of the Spitfire in 1938, a woman named Beatrice Schilling rebuilt and tested her favorite machine, a 490cc Norton motorcycle. This was the same bike she had ridden in the Brooklyn's races. Schilling became the fastest woman to ride a motorcycle on the track. She was a great racer, but an even better engineer. She was passionate about motorcycles since childhood. Around 1919, when Butts was just 10 years old, she noticed that her sisters went on cycle trips and she was always left behind. So she decided to save money to buy a motorcycle. By the time she was 14, she achieved her goal by buying a two-stroke Royal Enfield. Gradually, she began to troubleshoot her bike herself and soon became capable of disassembling and reassembling it. By the time she was 15, she decided that engineering would be her real career. But the only problem was that it was 1924 and the society at that time did not even think of making girls engineers. With the help of the Women's Engineering Society, in October 1929, Butts took admission in the Victoria University of Manchester. She took admission in the Department of Electrical Engineering of the University of Pennsylvania, where no girl had ever taken admission before. Later, she got the opportunity to take classes in thermodynamics and mechanical engineering, which was her real interest. She was not only an engineer, but also a woman who could race with men on the Brooklyn's track. This was possible only because she had made some changes to the carburetor of her 490cc Norton motorcycle, which increased its pickup beyond limits. At that time, Schilling herself did not know, but her ability was going to solve the biggest problem of the Speedfire and Hurricane fighters during World War II. Before the World War, Schilling had spent three years working in the Royal Aircraft Establishment. Initially, her job was only to write technical documentation, but in November 1939, after several promotions, Schilling reached the position of technical officer. Now, her responsibility was the research and development of the carburetor. When the engineers of Rolls-Royce failed to solve the Speedfire problem, Schilling asked for permission from the authorities to fix this problem. At first, everyone was underestimating her because she was a woman. But surprisingly, Schilling not only solved the problem in just a few days, but the authorities started laughing at themselves after seeing this solution. But what did she do? Schilling designed a small brass restrictor with a hole of a specific diameter. By fitting this plate in the carburetor, the problem of the ship was fixed to a great extent. The biggest advantage of this solution was that this brass plate could be fitted in the ship while standing. That is, it was not very time consuming. Now, the biggest problem was to go to different bases and install it in the speed fires. For this work also, Schilling used his Norton and went to different bases and installed this solution in the speed fire and hurricane fighters. This solution of Schilling was so successful that it was named Miss Schilling's office. This small plate had solved the biggest problem of the pilot to a great extent, if not completely. Later, Schilling solved this problem forever by designing a completely new carburetor for Rolls-Royce Merlin. After winning the World War II, the pilots gave all the credit to Schilling's ability. Eventually, for her hard work, she was awarded the Order of the British Empire. After the World War II, instead of leaving engineering, Schilling started working on new and advanced military projects. By 1950, her work had spread to new fields like rocketry, ramjets and guided weapons. In 1955, Schilling was made the senior principal scientific officer of the Royal Aircraft Establishment. Bettis Schilling was not just a mechanic or engineer. She was a charming character who was opening new doors for women in engineering. Even today, it is well believed that if Schilling had not been there in World War II, the map of the world would not have been the way it looks today. Hope you all will like and share this video. Thanks a lot for your comments. See you in the next great video.